Thank you so much for joining us today for our lunchtime forum on wellness in the workplace. I'm Patty Christofferson, Senior Manager for Workplace Sustainability at Actera. Just for some housekeeping items, um, if all attendees should, could set their audio settings to mute, that would be great. You're welcome to keep your cameras on. Um, we highly encourage and recommend it for the breakout session. Uh, use the chat function for any Q&A or comments. Um, we'll try and get to those throughout uh, periods in the presentation where we have kind of pauses and we can answer those questions. And then during the breakout session, we're actually trying something different. We're gonna allow the attendees to actually choose their own breakout rooms. So the agenda for the event, I'm just going through a quick welcome and introduction, which will be followed by opening remarks by each of the panelists. Um, we'll then have a moderated roundtable discussion followed by Q&A and then the breakout sessions. So for those of you who are not familiar with Actera, because I know when I looked at the registration, there were plenty of you that are very familiar and great supporters of Actera. So thank you for continuing to support us. Um, we are a, an environmental focused uh, nonprofit, bringing people together for a healthy planet. Our primary focus areas are around electrification, and that includes electric vehicle clinics and workshops, and education around greening your home, as well as food sustainability, uh, which relates to plant forward eating and reducing food waste, workplace sustainability, and education and policy. The Green Team Network falls under our workplace sustainability work. It's basically a community of sustainability professionals and company representatives interested in sustainability issues and actions in their workplace. We hold two forums each year. This is the spring one, and we have another one in the fall. And we also have sustainability resources and a private LinkedIn group, and membership is free. Here's just a sampling of some of the events we have. You can see this just is a one week period and we have a lot going on. Um, some of the highlights I'll just call out here. Um, the Fire and Climate Lecture was actually a series um, that we put on and uh, it was on climate drought and fire. And um, we also are doing a lot around Earth Day and we have a We Love Earth Festival in Menlo Park this weekend on Saturday with some cooking demonstrations and other um, restaurants and nonprofit organizations in our community. So check them out. So getting into our topic for today, what is well-being? Uh, when I first started doing some research on this topic, I found a lot of articles around you know, how we can take care of ourselves as individuals, you know, from yoga, meditation, nutrition, you know, just having active and healthy lifestyles. Um, when I came across this kind of this petal, flower um, from Stanford Well for Life, it really um, kind of honed in on sort of the various elements that we think about when we look at well-being. Um, you can read the overall definition they put together, but I feel like um, the talk today and our different um, panelists that we have will really talk about and address some of these areas. And it, to me, it really kind of came together when I saw it in this type of format and through the petals. So, whoops. Sorry about that, jumped too fast. Okay, so um, getting into our presenters today, I'd like to thank each of our presenters today in advance of their presentations, um, as well as our sponsor, LinkedIn. Um, I'd like to kick off this event with Kina David, Director of Sustainability, Wellness, and ESG for B BCCI Construction. She'll be talking about uh, well certification as it relates to her own company, as well as implementation for clients. Awesome, thank you, Patty. Um, so I put up there my my handle for our Twitter and Instagram and everything in case you wanna learn more about our sustainability. Um, but really what I wanna to talk to you all about today is the well building standard. Next slide, please. Go to the next one as well. So when we look at our spaces in which we occupy and uh, we build and have for our clients and employees, we really need to understand that our environment is changing how we live. It's changing our behaviors. It's changing how we interact. And recently with the pandemic, it's definitely changing, you know, health overall. Next slide, please. So, Statistics show we spend a little over 90% of our entire lives indoors. 
which is a really high amount of our time. And why do we really care about this? Next. The reason for that is because it has to do with our health. So according to the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control, genetics only make up about 10% of an individual's overall health. And over 50% is contributed by our social and physical environment. Next slide. So when we think about how we build, manage, and operate our spaces, we really have the largest impact to the health of our people and our communities in that area. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about different aspects that we can do in those environments to better our health. Next slide. So the well building standard, uh, it started back in 2014. And today it really is more of a roadmap to help with all aspects of an organization from health to well-being, as well as mitigating burnout, uh, stress relievers, there's a productivity piece, as, and um, really going into diversity and equity as well these days. Next. So the well-building standard today is in version two. And there are some other platforms under the well um, umbrella that I'll mention, but really focusing on the well building standard itself. Next. So well is different than most other green buildings, sustainability or wellness certifications you can get for a building. And the reason for that is because it's, it's a performance based system. So similar to things like LEED, which has been around for about 30 years now, we have a documentation portion of any certification project. But WELL really takes it beyond and has on-site testing. So when you build a space, you have to look at the different materials, look at the way that your systems are operating for daylight, for air quality. And then it's verified through that on-site testing and performance verification. Next. And well really is customizable for any space. So there's a minimum level of different features that get into a well project that are important for any type of building, whether it be a hotel, an office, a restaurant, a movie theater. And so well version two is really designed to be flexible while meeting a minimum standard of health and wellness in all well buildings. Next. So well version two has uh, 10 different concepts and they are air, water, nourishment, light, movement, thermal comfort, sound, materials, mind, and community, and innovations, which is kind of the free 11th category. But with each of these, there's required features and then optional features called optimizations. So building out what a project would implement really comes into uh, customizing it for each of these features depending on the organization. Next. So it's really flexible. Um, again, having that kind of minimum level of preconditions that set the health standards for any type of building and then customizing it depending on your organization. Maybe healthy foods is really the area that's important to you, or maybe it's movement and physical fitness in the space. So it's a great tool to have a well building that suits the needs of any type of client. Next. And it's holistic. So you look at the design and construction of a building. There's also a big policy piece. So getting involved with the HR, the benefits for employees, and then operations. So going on to that kind of ongoing, how is the building performing, much more related to air quality and things like that. Next. So I've broken down in the features, um, which concepts are really more geared towards design, policy, or operations. 
And when you're going through a, a new build or a renovation, thermal comfort, light, materials, and sound, so really related to acoustics, are the key items that you need to consider during the design. And that's not to say that other concepts don't have design elements, but these are more heavily weighted in the design and construction of a physical space. Also, much more challenging to obtain the required preconditions for these categories if you are not currently going through a capital improvement or a build. So well is designed for both new and existing buildings, but when you're really building out a space, you wanna look at the mechanical systems for thermal comfort. You wanna make sure that there's soft surfaces to absorb the sounds. Material toxicity is a big focus here. So the right selection of materials going into your space and then light. So whatever daylighting you're using, the layout of different occupant areas, it all goes into this piece. Next. So the policy related items are really nourishment. Um, so what kind of foods do you provide? Do you have different options or education about healthy foods? Movement, so this is much more related to physical fitness, whether it be fitness incentives or uh, educating about different aspects of being physical, wearables for your employees. Mind, this is really related to the health benefits, um, whether it be mental health or physical health, and then community. So how do you have policies to really give back to the community, incorporate diversity, equity, inclusion, and stewardship. Next. And then operations. So air and water are the two aspects of any well space that really require ongoing maintenance. And this helps to assure that your air and water quality is top of line for your occupants, not only when you first build it, but throughout the life cycle of a well space and you're occupying it. Well certified buildings need to recertify every three years and air and water needs to maintain a air quality and water quality analysis annually in order to maintain this certification. Next. So one of the questions I always get is what about the ROI? right? We've heard that well certification is expensive. Well, um, we also know that disengaged employees are expensive and um, loss of productivity as well as uh, loss of retention of employees is a huge cost coming to companies, especially in the Bay Area. Next. And when we look at the overall cost of buildings, about 10% of that is the actual energy to run the space and the rent and operations. 90% of our cost when it comes to our built environment is directly related to the people. So when we think about implementing these wellness features into a built environment, we really have the impact of employee productivity, prolonged health, uh, better retention, and a recruitment tool. Next. Another thing that we can think about it is um, corporate wellness programs tend to be utilized about 15% of the time. And they are very, very costly for organizations to implement. But if you have a well-certified space, 100% of your employees are uh, passively participating in that wellness program every day they show up to the office. So it's another really great example of putting your dollars where it's going to impact people the most. Again, going back to that over 50% of our health is defined by our physical and social environment. Next. So yes, we all want to be in a healthy space, um, but well also understands that it's not just about the health of the indoor environment, it's also about the health of the planet. So there is a direct correlation between climate health and human health. Um, but it does lend itself to say, you know, what, what about those other rating systems that we've all talked about for years? 
So WELL is designed to work in tandem with the major green building rating systems on the market today, such as LEED, BRIAM, Living Building Challenge, and Green Star. And the way that this happens is there's a huge overlap with indoor air quality and policies. Where the takeoffs come is around energy consumption, and WELL is looking into how we can better the energy consumption of the buildings while having good air quality and good lighting quality, et cetera. Next. And here's just kind of a snapshot of the multiple pathways that organizations and individuals can participate in the well building platform. So buildings can achieve well certification. You can also have a well accreditation. So individuals can become well APs. There's a membership program for education for both um, individuals and organizations. And then there's a well portfolio program for large organizations who want to really uh, streamline and uh, standardize their approach to well. And lastly, in 2020, they came out with the well health safety rating. So this was a direct response to COVID-19 where it really focuses on the reduction of viral transmission, but also emergency preparedness for any type of emergency within a building. I'll just hand it back over to Patty now, because I know there's probably more we're gonna talk about when we get to the question and answer portion. Patty, I'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Victoria Michaelchuk. Um, I am the Healthy Buildings and Sustainability Design Expert at Genentech. Um, and I'm super excited to be here today, mostly just to talk about why I love my job so much. Um, when, when Patty contacted me with this opportunity, uh, I thought it was really great because it, it gave me the opportunity to highlight not only what we do at Genentech, um, but but kind of how my role has evolved. So just for a little bit of background, Genentech, we're a biotech company headquartered in South San Francisco. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we had maybe 10, 12,000 people on average on our South San Francisco site every day. Following the pandemic, um, just this past month, we've returned employees back to campus. Uh, we're averaging a little bit less with our flexible work environments and flexible work schedules. So five to 6,000 um, employees are on site in any given day. So just a little bit less. You know, but why I love my job at Genentech so much is it truly relates back to our commitment to this strong culture of both innovation and sustainability. You know, we have very ambitious sustainability goals here at Genentech, and it, it forces us to be you know, just to integrate environmental consciousness into the decision making across the business and all of our functional groups. This month for Earth Month, um, our theme this year is every job is a climate job. And I love that theme because it, it relates to how I got my role, which was really focused on employee health. And as we continued having these conversations was looking more at, you know, there's there's a lot of things that we're doing that not only touch employees and benefit employees and their health, um, but they also benefit the health of the planet. So next slide, please. The beauty of following Kenna's presentation is it was a great segue to share what we've done in this space um, and how, how we've got there. So we've leveraged building certification systems to help us kind of mature within the employee health and well-being space. Uh, we started back, we'll go back to 2015 when this first building on the left um, opened. It's all office space building, but it was a first LEED certification project. Um, that building achieved LEED Gold, and it was really our entry point into thinking more about how the built environment interacts with employee health. All right, we had done all the employee health programs, we have the benefits, uh, but this, when we went through LEED certification and started thinking about materials, started thinking about lighting and views of nature and the biophilia elements, it caused my team to really start thinking more about that, that point kind of made is this touches everybody. Everybody who comes into this space interacts with this health program. So as we finished off this first building, 
um, we were building a new employee center and our employee center houses our our health center for work injuries, it houses our IT support and our IT help bar, our ergonomics showroom and ergonomics support, as well as our gym and fitness center. And so for us, it really made sense to capture this built um, from the building process to capture the health, well being, and sustainability initiatives that we were talking about in this building. So for our employee center, we chose to pursue well certification um, and achieve well goals for that building. And then it spiraled us to start thinking about, okay, well, how do we do this scale now? Um, this is one building, now maybe two buildings on campus that we've been very mindful about in the construction process. And those were brand new builds. But how do we do this across scale uh, to all of our buildings with over 50 buildings on campus? And what do we do to those older spaces? How do we renovate them? Um, or how do we make more robust operations and policies to really ensure that they're meeting the needs and the standards that we see and value as being important. So next slide, please. This slide outlines the business case that we presented to leadership in order to pursue formal certification. So once we came off these first two projects, um, a lot of these, these things were built in and baked into how, how we do things at Genentech, how we build um, our operation standards. But we saw benefit in the formal certification, um, and it was for these four reasons. Was one, it really showcases and promotes our culture of health and well-being. Um, if anything, it puts a nice pretty bow and really gives this holistic approach um, to being able to tell and explain to employees all of the things that we're doing um, to put their health first and keep their health and their health and well-being needs in in front of mind. The next was around ease of implementation. Now, this isn't to say that it's easy necessarily to certify spaces. There, there is quite a bit of legwork that goes into them. Um, it does take time. However, the ease of implementation was really around the tools that you get. Um, so with all of these certifications, there's lots of research and literature that has been compiled and is presented for each of the strategies. And, and that made it easy to say, here's, here's what we need to be best in class. The second part is the scorecards. So being able to score our existing buildings and say, ooh, this one scored well, this one didn't score so well, here's where we're lacking. And that created this framework for the future. What do we do next? what do we need to do across the site and what do we need to do in specific spaces um, to, really, to really make our health programs more robust. And then the last was this opportunity to highlight how we collaborate. So this opportunity for working better together, which is a tagline we have across Genentech on how do we collaborate across our business groups. You know, this wasn't something that I could do alone in, in one cube, in one office space. It really took our, our design team, our construction team, um, the ongoing facilities and operations maintenance was needed by our operations team, um, our campus destinations and workforce services team that, that create the amenities and events that happen in these spaces, um, as well as our health services, our HR partners. Um, it took everybody. So it was a nice opportunity again to highlight, here's how we all work together for the betterment of our employees. Um, if you could click once for me, one of the things I wanna highlight with these, this building um, that's in the picture is this building, it's a two-star Fitwell certified building. It's, it wasn't a new construction project. This was the first Fitwell building that we certified that had a little bit, we renovated a few floors, just some, some common spaces and breakaway break areas. Uh, but for the most part, the building, the building was built. Um, and I like this story because it was it's part of our pandemic story. You know, we sought out to to become a Fitwell legacy or Fitwell champion pre pandemic. Um, and when we entered pandemic, a lot of the planned construction that we had was paused um, or timelines were changed. And so there wasn't really, you know, big focal area on where are we scoring out as we go through this project? No, we, we followed the standards that we created from our first two learnings and we built to those internal standards that we had built. Um, the robustness of those conversations that we had and the standards that we built allowed us to come back in after construction was finished, score and say, we know we'll hit one star, but can we hit two, two star? Um, it, and my pride and joy with, with this project was, yes, we were able to hit two stars with this building. So next slide, please. 
As I mentioned, you know, there's been a few kind of key areas that we've chosen to highlight and build into our design standards when we're talking about structural design or new spaces or renovating spaces. Um, those align with the healthy material selection and views of nature, which kind of kind of highlighted in her presentation. And we pulled very strongly from well and fit well referencing and documentation to make those standards. The third was around tobacco free campus policy. Uh, and, and while this isn't necessarily something new, the pandemic brought a different light to this. You know, as we have people coming back to our spaces, more people are wanting to meet and gather in our outdoor spaces, and that's sometimes more than 25 feet away from a building. And so making sure that all of our spaces, all of our outdoor spaces across campus um, are tobacco free, that we're not having tobacco products on it, just make sure that we foster again that culture of health and create safe, healthy environments, even in our outdoor spaces. So next slide. What I do want to spend a little bit more time on today um, is highlighting these three kind of healthy operational policies and experiences that people have at Genentech. So the three being, you know, our green cleaning standards, which is an operational piece, um, our healthy food and sustainable dining, which couples the two with policy and the experience, and then how we incentivize green transportation. So we'll start out um, on the next slide with green cleaning standards. As we begin to tackle this, um, the first thing we did was define the product standards. So there's two pieces to this cleaning standard. One is around the cleaning chemical selection. So this includes anything that we would put on um, surfaces, floors to clean, to chemically clean, um, as well as hand soaps and hand sanitizers. The second piece was around cleaning equipment. So this includes paper products, trash bags, and power janitorial equipment, such as vacuums. Um, and for ease of use, I went ahead and put these three kind of logo seals at the bottom, um, which highlight where we choose. This is kind of our default choice for selecting chemical cleaning products. Um, if a product isn't third party labeled with one of these, then we will go back and look at the SDS um, and look for hazard categories for products. That one uh, was where I typically get pulled in a little bit more, but kind of the ease of use was being able to tell our operation staff, if you're looking at a new product, just look for the label and it makes it a little easier. The second part was then evaluating the existing products we had. So in 2019, about 80% of our annual cleaning purchases uh, met the standards that we set. And then from there, we started to identify what products we needed to find alternatives from. And our operations team worked with our, their procurement partners to say, okay, how do we find new products? Um, how do we bring these in? How do we procure them to make sure we these become our standard order? And then the third part was setting targets for success. Um, this one is really, really focused more so on vacuums and, and power janitorial equipment, like the you know, vacuums and scrubbers. To say some some of the equipment we had was still newer. We didn't want to just throw it out. Um, so again, instead developing this kind of five year phase out plan to ensure that the equipment was moving towards um, both ergonomic, environmental, and safety preferences that we had set with our, our standards. Currently, we're at about 90% of annual cleaning purchase purchases that meet standards. And over the next two years, we're looking to hit 100%. Next slide, please. So the next one is around food. Um, and food's a really big topic um, because it's it's so intimate. Um, we have to eat and there's a big cultural um, and social piece that's connected to food. So when we started outlining, you know, what were we gonna do around health initiatives around food? Um, we immediately saw that there was a direct connection to climate, right? Food that's healthier for you, plant-based diets um, are not only better for us and for our bodies, but they also have a lower CO2 footprint and they're also better for the environment. So in 2019, we signed on to the Cool Food Pledge uh, and essentially um, agreed and committed to lowering our agriculture, our food-related greenhouse gas emissions by 25% relative to our 2018 numbers. In order to be successful on this, we've collaborated with our on-site food vendors, trying to increase our offerings, so the type of food that's served in our cafes, 
and then increasing awareness and promotion of plant-rich foods and dishes. Simultaneously, we also want to really encourage people to use reusable dining tableware to bring in, a, again, the second sustainability piece and minimize waste. Um, and that took a lot of partnership with our business groups, really trying to create that culture that allows people to choose the dining option. Um, we know this has health benefits too. When you leave your office and you take a break, take a break from work during the day, sit down, enjoy your meal. Um, the last thing I'll highlight here on this slide is our Plan It Forward $4 meals. This is something that developed over the pandemic. Um, and as we returned, we wanted to highlight the creativity of our chefs on site. So they came out with this daily special that focuses on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And the best part is that it's subsidized at $4. So it's good for you, it's good for your body, it's good for the planet, um, and it's, it's friendly on your pocketbook too. So one last slide um, highlighting our transportation incentives. This was a joint partnership with our planning and our construction team, as well as our GRIDE team. And our GRIDE team at Genetic has done fabulous work around really promoting modes of transportation that are environmentally conscious and environmentally friendly. The first step we did here was establishing bicycle parking. So before we or simultaneously to incentivizing, we knew that there was an increasing demand for people biking to work. So we wanted to make sure we had infrastructure that supported that. So currently we have 20 bike lockers and about 217 bike parking spaces on campus that are indoored and secured through our badge, badge entry system that allow for people to park their bikes in a safe location. Um, we also couple this with commuter showers that are kind of spread out throughout the campus as well. And then incentivizing. So we, uh, we used to offer pre-pandemic $6 per commute, so $6 to work, and then $6 on your way home for a total of $12 a day if you bike to work. And we recently upped that um, because we really want to drive that behavior change piece around taking in um, a better mode of transportation to come into the work environment. So we've upped it to $10 uh, per commute or $20 a day. Next slide, please. And so I'll end here. Um, I've put my contact information up on the slide. If you're interested in anything more that we're doing, you just want to connect, um, feel free, put comments in today, um, or reach out to me, LinkedIn or email. Um, I'm happy to always have a conversation with a colleague and talk more about what we can do in this area. And I believe next I will pass it over to Tim. Thank you, Victoria. And your last slide there about incentivizing bicycling is a nice segue for me. So my name is Tim Hui. I'm a program manager for Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. Um, my last name is pronounced Wee, like W-E-E. -E. It's an Indonesian Chinese name with a Dutch spelling. Um, just to explain <laughs> the spelling there. Uh, next slide. And I'm going to talk about work, wellness, and bicycling. Um, by the way, I used to be in uh, tech product development for about 30 plus years for Apple, Adobe, and some other companies. I, in 2016, I switched to not working for nonprofits and have been working for the Bike Coalition um, since 2018, although I was also one of their founding board members back in 1993 for the Bike Coalition. I had volunteered in the interim. Um, and I'm about to share some pictures with you about what I do for bicycling, because bicycling is one of the best things you can do both for wellness and to get to work. So next slide. There we go. There is my main commuting bike in all its glory. And you notice I've got metal baskets on the back um, and, and one of them is a bag that happens to be an inside out dog food bag. I'm also a zero waster, by the way. So I'm going zero waste in all ways. Uh, and bicycling is my zero waste way to get to work. And I commute to work um, at Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition in San Jose, it's 12 miles each way, so 24 miles round trip. And um, this bike you know, has fenders, I've got lights, I've got cameras, I've got water bottles, I've got a pump, I've got everything on it that I need um, to get to where I need to go. And when I go shopping, for instance, I actually shop into the back of my bike, uh, the baskets there, because um, I just go everywhere by bike. And when I say go everywhere, I, ca I carry everything. Next slide. If I need to do a bigger shop, I have a trailer I hook up that can fit about as much as the car trunk can if I go to a grocery store and I can roll this inside as my shopping cart. And if I need to carry more, next slide, 
I've actually taken all of this, which would fill up a minivan to uh, run a bicycle education workshop. So um, I'm pulling about 600 pounds of stuff. I can hit basically between me, my trailers and the bike, I can just about a thousand pounds. So I can carry more with my bike than most of you can carry with your car. Next slide. <laughs> Even to the extent of carrying like 13 bikes with my bike, which would fill up most cargo vans with equipment. So yes, I carry a lot with my bike. Next slide. And you don't have to be, you know, people can, there are a lot of different kinds of bikes out here. Here's my wife and I and our different kind of tandem riding around. Next slide. And um, you, if you need a tricycle, here's an elderly neighbor who bikes around just fine, not in a bicycle, but he continues to get around. Next slide. And here's a woman who's on a tricycle, again, an electric tricycle, because she's no longer able to pedal very well, um, but she gets around just fine here on a trail. Next slide. And here's someone, um, actually a friend of mine, unfortunately, was, was hit by a car and she's still recovering. And she's on this uh, recumbent tandem bicycling around with her dog. Um, yeah, so even if you aren't, don't think you're able, you are able to bike. Next slide. And here's yet one more example of another person um, with some handicaps who's biking around with his dad that I met um, at a local park. So yes, you can get around just fine by bicycle. Uh, next slide. And this was actually a, a, a vet who uh, is actually on a four wheel quadricycle now. Um, he needs something very stable, low to the ground, and he's able to get around. Uh, next slide. So bicycling has many, many benefits. Your health, climate change, you save money. Um, actually, uh, for money, you can save about a million dollars over your lifetime if you choose to bike instead of drive. That's a lot, you can retire early. As far as climate change goes, um, in California, 50% of our greenhouse gases are from transportation. And bicycling completely solves that. Electric vehicles get us part way there, but not far enough, as it were, because electric vehicles still require a lot of parking, they require a lot of big roadways, and there's a huge amount of resources that go into electric vehicles. So if you really want to get all the way, go all the way and go biking. Um, they're also very equitable. Everyone can afford to bike. It's great for your community. You get to meet people on the road, say hi to them. On my commute to work, I typically say hi to dozens of people. Um, there's a, a retirement home I go by and there's people out in the curb sunning themselves typically. I say hi to them like every day I go into work. It reduces traffic congestion. Bicycles are small and skinny versus the big fat vehicles. Great for air quality and it's excellent for safety. Um, bicycles, if everyone bikes, it's safer for everyone because bikes don't kill people so much. Uh, motor vehicles are not quite the same. Motor vehicles in the United States kill about 40,000 people every year. That's like 15 9 11s every year. And why aren't people getting more outraged? People are outraged by 9 11. If you had 15 of those happening every year, you would think more people would care. But it's hard. Um, unfortunately, uh, convenience dominates over people's sense of saving lives. I'm hoping to get a lot of you to switch over and bike instead. Next slide. So, Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition, a little bit about this. We're a nonprofit member based organization that supports better bicycling all over Silicon Valley. We're all about creating critical mass. Um, our mission is to create a healthy community environment and economy through bicycling. Um, we honor diversity, equity, and inclusion because they're central to our work. And we really need money, people, and partners. And that equals political power so we can get changes happening. Um, we have plenty of money. Um, if we shifted just a fraction of what we spend on motor vehicle facilities or biking and walking, we could have all the deluxe facilities we really want, but we need money, people, and partners to help us get there. Next slide. So one of the ways we um, use that money is for advocacy. Um, we influence infrastructure projects and help change laws. We have local teams throughout San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Local teams are sets of volunteers on the ground in each city. So if any of you want to become a local team member, they have a huge impact. Um, one of our local team people like Ari Feinsmith in Sunnyvale was successful at getting temporary um, bike and walk lanes on Tasman in North Sunnyvale. Also, he's helped in a lot of other projects and getting people out with free bike repair clinics. We also host a bike summit every year where you can learn more about how um, about bike advocacy and how to change your community. Um, we focus on policies um, like El Camino Real, which, is, which hopefully at some point will become a bike super highway, which we're working on, our central bikeway. Um, the Barton Rail also we're working on in San Mateo County. 
I'm, I'm a member of the VTA BPAC. Um, so I actually sit in the BPAC for Sunnyvale as well as VTA. And the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition also has a seat on the VTA BPAC with another of our staff as representative. We have a seat on Caltrans District 4, which influences um, the highway policies and projects for the entire nine county Bay Area. And we work with all local governments. Um, there are like 34 ish city governments in San Mateo County, and there's 20 or so in San Clara County. We have a population base of about 3 million people we're trying to service with our advocacy. Next slide. And we also have a lot of programs that we run that are funded by grants, like typically government grants, sometimes corporate grants. Uh, we have bicycle education. There's an adult bike education program funded by VTA that I'm actually also running. We have safe routes to school programs, bike to wherever days programs, is an, uh, bike to wherever days, bike month, May. I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more in a minute. Is a huge opportunity for us to get as many people as possible getting out there and riding. It used to be called bike to work day. A lot of people still aren't going to work on their bike. So we're just keeping it with bike to wherever. And that may actually may be the permanent name change uh, that the pandemic has uh, caused because we really want everyone to bike wherever, to shopping, to libraries, to school, to work. Um, biking is great. We also have commute workshops, which we can come to your, um, to your place of work or we can do online to help your employees learn how they can bike to work. Uh, Valley Bike Parking is a service that uh, the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition provides for large events. And um, we do bike parking at Levi Stadium and at um, San Jose Jazz and other events. So that people have safe and secure parking where they can just leave their bike and be confident that all the parts are gonna be there when they come back. We do social rides so that people can get used to uh, riding and just more familiar with it and have fun. Um, we're a fiscal sponsor of the San Jose Bike Clinic in downtown San Jose, which provides free bike repair services to whoever shows up and wants to learn how to do bike repair. Next slide. Our major events, as mentioned, BTWD or Bike Tour Every Days 2022 is coming to a corner near you or actually all over the, <laughs> the area uh, and Bike Month. We wanna encourage as many people to bike for transportation as possible. Again, I mentioned our Bike Summit earlier. That's about more educating professionals, elected uh, and appointed officials and advocates on how they can change their environment. And then in the fall, we have a fun fundraising ride. Um, have fun and raise money for SUBC. Next slide. So. Key actions for you, and back to what Victoria mentioned, parking is critical. People, when they go to work, they need to have safe places for their bikes. My personal favorite in all cases is just encourage your workplace or whatever your shop to just let people roll their bike inside. I actually use my bike as my shopping cart in a grocery store and all the places I've worked, um, or recently at least, I've just rolled my bike in, put it next to my cube or in my cube, and that was my bike parking so that my lunch was on it, my water is on it, and it was just right next to me in my wherever I was working. So um, get bike parking for your workplaces and, uh, and for wherever you shop and make sure that it is completely secure. Um, the best bike parking, if you can't bring it inside with you, is a bike locker because it keeps it completely enclosed, it's out of the weather, and people can't take off little bits of your bike. You notice, if you remember the picture of my bike had all these bits on it, I'd rather not have to disassemble my entire bike every time I need to park it and move it all inside. Um, cars have this multi-ton you know, security cage around them, locking everything inside of it. A bike is not so lucky, but bikes also are super more, much more efficient. So um, honor the bike, have the secure cage at the location that doesn't need to move around so people can roll their bikes in or just roll them inside. Second action item is get educated. Being a better cyclist can help both you and the rest of the world um, operate more effectively and efficiently and safely. Uh, Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition has a whole host of programs and education programs that are free um, that are on our website. If you go to bikesiliconvalley.org slash program slash education, um, then our other programs, Bike to Wherever Day, in particular, as many people as possible, including everyone here on this call, pledge to ride during May. Go for a bike ride and pledge to ride at bikesiliconvalley.org slash P2R. So share that far and wide. We're trying to get as many people as possible to pledge to ride. And uh, this is um, this pledge to ride is the point of our spear around um, bike to wherever days because it's our measure, our primary metric. And if you pledge to ride, you're very committed to riding. So we really want to get as many people out there to bike as possible. Here's my email address, tim at bikesiliconvalley.org. If you Google me, Tim Wee, I'm a very unique name. You can find all my LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera, and befriend me, whatever. Um, we can link up on LinkedIn. So thanks very much.
for your time. Thank you so much, Tim. All right, well, we're going to move into our roundtable discussion now. I'm feeling really inspired um, by everyone's enthusiasm as well. So I wanted to introduce myself. I am Brian Boyle. I am a management analyst at the County of Santa Clara Office of Sustainability. And I'm going to be moderating our roundtable discussion. So as we're moving into that, I just want to encourage folks, if you have questions that have come up from those presentations, put them in the chat, and we will cover those during our Q&A portion. So feel free to put whatever you're thinking about, comments, questions into the chat there. Um, but I'm going to move on to our roundtable and our first question for our panelists. I wanted to ask, how are your organizations measuring the environmental impacts of the benefits being offered? And anyone that wants to start, feel free. Well, I can jump in specifically around the food piece um, that I that I shared. So each year, this this was a growing initiative. I think when we first committed to doing this, we didn't realize how far we were in over our heads. Um, being a large organization, our food procurement comes from a lot of spots. Um, we also partner with a lot of small farms and small like um, local companies, local produce places. We were getting in paper receipts, we were getting in electronic receipts, and so we actually had to build out infrastructure to kind of track, like a really good tracking system of here's the exact cost and here's the exact weight of everything that we brought in, um, because it wasn't necessarily in one spot. But now we're able to calculate out, okay, how many pounds of all of our proteins did we procure in a year? Um, and then we actually share that with Cool Foods, so with this third party that helps us calculate and translate that into um, greenhouse gas emissions. I can jump in on that as well. Um, so at BCCI, we have a commitment to well certification in our corporate offices. And so both our San Francisco and Silicon Valley office have been well certified for a number of years. And with that, we do annual well building surveys. So we're really polling our occupants to see what aspects of the physical and policies around um, our office is contributing in a positive or negative or neutral way to their perceived health and well-being. So one thing that we have seen over the years is that air quality is always something that people uh, comment on. And a couple years ago, it was definitely something that People were happy that we were doing so well in. We installed some air purification systems mid-pandemic in addition to just having a high level of filtration. So that was a really positive thing for people to feel safe going back into our spaces. Being a general contractor uh, at our core, we have been in our offices since May of 2020. And I'm happy to report that during this entire time, we have not had any intra-office transmission of COVID-19. So I think a lot of that really does come from some of the well practices that we already had in place, um, which is a, a huge thing when we're talking about, you know, where the state of the world is today, getting people back into their spaces and really having that level of assurance and transparency on what your organization or building management has done to keep you safe. From the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition perspective, um, we're measuring uh, metrics of how many people are riding, trying to get mode share. We want to get 10% switch of mode share to bikes by 2025. It's coming up fast. Now, another easy way is you just look outside, watch how many people bike versus drive. And when the um, traffic reports are no longer needed because you'd have to report in traffic congestion, we're well on our way <laughs> to get it reducing car traffic. So let's see if more people out there on bikes. And during the pandemic, I think a lot of us saw a lot of people popping out there on bikes um, because it is naturally socially distanced. You have great airflow around you. It's a very safe thing to do during a pandemic um, and it's fun. And it was great that we had a lot of reduction in car traffic, which also made people feel safer. So we're measuring bike counting bicyclists. So yeah, get out there and bike. Thank you all. So speaking of the pandemic, I'm curious how you think the pandemic has altered what employees are asking for and what they're looking for in terms of a healthy physical workspace 
when they're being asked to come back to work. And I know we've mentioned air filtration. I'm curious if you want to elaborate on that or if there's other things that employees are asking for as they come back to work. I think air quality is definitely something that we're seeing a question around from almost everyone these days. People who did not care about it pre-pandemic or didn't even really think about it. So we're definitely seeing that. Uh, California has increased the code minimum requirement for mechanical systems. So you have to have a certain filtration rating, which is, you know, intended to prevent as much of the kind of viral transmission as possible. But I think really what we're seeing is more need for flexible spaces. So when we're relating it to design, some people are going to have flexible schedules because hybrid work environments are a factor of the corporate world that we all live in today. And that means you're gonna need to have more quiet zones, more areas where people can take their laptop and plug in. Um, because the open office where everyone is Zooming at the same time is just not happening. <laughs> Yeah, kind of, I would think I would agree with that, especially around the flexibility. That seems to be the biggest comment that we hear now is flexibility and when I can come, flexibility and I can, when I can be there, and just flexibility of what space that I'm in. Um, and so having those kind of different zones has been very impactful. But then now there's an expectation, at least with our employees, because we have so many buildings is I, I expect one like to say this have the same quality of building in building two as I do in building seven. Um, and so for us, it's really what had forced us to look at, OK, what what are those buildings that that we need to do a little bit of upgrading and renovation in? And then what are some of the lower hanging fruits? Right. Like, can we bring in more biophilic elements that, you know, can we put plant life in here that just creates warmth in the space um, and makes it more enticing? And that might be a little bit easier, quicker to do than having to actually push out walls or, or do hard, you know, construction renovation type projects. And from the bicycling standpoint, yeah, better bike parking, get rid of car parking. Car parking is hugely expensive. It's like thirty to fifty thousand dollars per space. And you fit 10 bikes in the space, you can fit a car. So it's more economical to switch over to bike parking, which we need. And yeah, the um, Employees, they're, they're asking for safe facilities. They've got great air outside as long as we don't have wildfires or as long as we don't have a lot of motor vehicles creating pollution. <laughs> so and outside, um, yeah, you can put a mask on, but that's not much fun to bike in. Um, it's just hot. So uh, yeah, let's have our air quality outside be clean to start with and not have to filter it so much. Thank you. I'd like to actually Thank ask you. a follow-up question uh, to Victoria about this. You know, one of the things that we've seen as kind of a result of the pandemic is people who had really great cafeterias or food amenities for their employees, moving to more processed packaged foods to eliminate the kind of worry that people have about sharing things. Uh, what have you seen in that area at Genentech? Yeah, so that was hard for us. Um, our cafes were very open. They were, we had some that were self-serve and some that were lined. Um, but we actually went to like single serve meals. We even stopped giving choice over the pandemic because we just we couldn't get people through lines in an efficient way that was socially distanced um, and, and didn't take a large amount of time away from people in the middle of the workday. So we went to packaging food. Uh, we still made food, so we didn't buy pre-packaged food. We'd make food and we'd box it in compostables. Um, but there's still bioplastics in them. So again, it's not as ideal as eating on a plate. Um, as we've returned more people to the office, we've, we've been able to go back to, back to silverware, back to flatware. That's been fairly accepted. Um, there's less asking for packaging, even including with condiments, things like even our ketchup, we went from having bottles of ketchups where you could self-serve to having packets. Those things have slowly started to transition back um, the one area where we're actually questioning now is returning to having farmers markets on site um, or selling produce on site. Is people really don't want other people touching their produce now, um, which is interesting because this is this doesn't seem to be a problem at grocery stores. Like when I go to the grocery store, I buy my produce, 
but I know I'm taking it home to eat it. And so I think it's somewhat shifting that mindset, using signage, having people are there to just talk to employees about what their options are to say, you can, you can wash this in the kitchenette before you eat it. Um, this isn't necessarily different than what you would experience outside of the workplace at, at a farmer's market outside or at, at the grocery store that you go to. Um, but people seem to be more willing to come back into the space. Uh, we've also used this as an opportunity to encourage people to bring their own. Um, especially if you want to take your food away, bring your own fork, bring your own cup. If, if you are truly worried, that's okay. That's understandable. Um, but if you bring your own fork and you bring your own cup, that's one less thing that we're putting into our waste bins. Um, and it can give you that reassurance and peace of mind that I wash this fork. Um, I know where it came from. So trying to kind of take all the lenses that we can to, to nudge people back in the direction. Thanks, Victoria. We had a great question from an audience member that I'm going to go over for all of you, really. I'm wondering how these environmental offerings interact or overlap with company culture and management culture, things like morale, overwork, burnout, camaraderie. How have you experienced uh, that in your workplace? So I'll chime in here. Um, bicycling definitely fits because it's a great psychological relief for people to ride their bike uh, and relieve stress. And you can go out and a uh, team, actually Google has a, um, a meeting bike you can use to, to ride around outside. <laughs> you can hold a meeting outside uh, and everyone biking around. Um, but yeah, uh, people are getting burned out. And rather than you know fuming in your burnout, stuck in your car, stuck in traffic, you can be enjoying biking and getting some exercise and re turning commute time into a useful time versus kind of just, I'm stuck in my car time. Um, and uh, yeah, so we hope bicycling is a great solution to this burnout that people are having and allowing people to safely interact outdoors. Um, I, I would admit, say, I... go ahead, Kenna. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, for us, you know, I think wellness and uh, really showing up for our employees is at the heart of our culture. Um, we build a lot of spaces for our clients that are great interior spaces and really taking care of the health of the people. So we really have that in mind at our own organization. I think over the pandemic, things, you know, go in waves where there's, you know, just so much going on in the world and people tend to get into a cycle. So what we're really looking at is having more opportunities for education around mental wellness and how we can use different stress relieving techniques in our day to day lives to combat that burnout. Uh, but I would say we're definitely noticing signs of it everywhere in the world. Um, so it's it's ever ongoing. So I wanted to add um, one of the things that we did during the pandemic was create protected time. And it was this 12 to 2 p.m. block. Um, we started it very early in the pandemic when everybody essentially was at home because we recognized it. People had their kids at home, schools weren't open still, and you had parents that were trying to feed themselves and feed their kids. And it was like, I finished at 11.59, I have a 12.30 meeting, or I have a lunchtime meeting, because we all used to do that and work through lunch. And how am I, like, you can't even go get food because you can't leave your house, you have to have something ready. Like maybe you take something out of the freezer and stick it in the microwave, but I still got to get my kids corralled it was causing excess stress. And so at the highest level, our leadership team, um, our C-suite essentially said, no meetings, 12 to two, unless it's super business critical or you're meeting with some outside person, just don't do it. And you have every right to decline an external meeting that's during that protected time if you can't make it. This is what we're gonna set as our company culture. Now, as people started coming back, we started getting towards the end of the pandemic, people were starting to say, well, if we block the 12 to 2 and now we're commuting in the 8 to 9 and 4 to 5 hour, I've, I've got a limited time where I can have meetings. We need our 12 to 2 back. 
And there was a big group of people that argued, no, I liked it. I liked having my head's down time. Even if I don't have kids in my house, it gave me a chance in the middle of the day to stop having Zoom meetings, to eat my food, to answer an email, to just sit and be. Um, and our team thought this was a great opportunity as everybody started negotiating whether we keep or change or get rid of the 12 to two was to say, let's keep it because it gives people the time to take the mental health break, to go sit down, to connect with a colleague and to dine in. We have less waste when we dine in. Um, people see the great menu options when they're there um, and we can entice them towards the healthy food that's put in the front of our cafeterias. Um, so we, we helped advocate to keep it. Um, it stayed at 12 to one, it shortened. But the 12 to 1 is still a protected lunch hour and, and people can eat, people can go to the gym, people can take a walk, whatever it is they choose to do. But that was something um, from the highest level we, we helped advocate for. And it came directly from leadership to say we're going to keep 12 to 1 protected time. That's great, Victoria. And it's really inspiring to see like your leadership at the very top was supportive of this. I'm curious, um, for some of the other programs we've been talking about, have you seen pushback from your organizations to prioritize wellness or prioritize some of these programs? And how have you address, addressed some of the concerns that you've heard? I'll chime in. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> so on the biking side, it's not so much people have pushed back. It's more that, um, no action has sometimes been taken so that we don't get enough engagement. It's just, you know, so um, yeah. So that's the protector from the bicycling side. There generally isn't pushback exactly. It's more like uh, we don't get attention some, a lot of the time. I would say um, generally, no. We, we really have been committed to this wellness certification in our corporate spaces um, since 2015 or 16. And so it's become really a part of our culture. We have Wellness Wednesdays, which used to be, you know, get together in the break rooms and have some healthy snacks with your coworkers. That's shifted to we have um, fresh cold pressed juices to arrive Wednesday mornings. So we're still getting it. It's again in a little bit of a different form. Um, but, you know, the amount of times that the construction sites have a safety moment that is focused on a wellness is huge now. So it is definitely becoming more of a vernacular within our firm, not only in our corporate offices, but throughout all of BCCI, which I think has been really awesome. You know, if if I'm being fully transparent, I think when we started these conversations and really started thinking about certification six, 10 years ago, we were in a period of growth in our company. Um, and so these things made sense, right? We should do wellness. Okay, let's do wellness. And there was very little pushback. Um, sometimes there's questions around, will it take more time if we're talking about a specific um, project related to construction? Um, or if we're talking about keeping things, is this going to cause more time and burden on people? But it was never a pushback. Um, I think now somewhat of the financial situation is a bit different. Uh, the budgets are tighter. My budget's tighter. And so there's more of that ROI question or the um, how much more is this going to cost a project? And we have to find those other lenses, right? So for, for 12 to 1 protected time, for example, there's other reasons why people were advocating to keep 12 to 1. The health and sustainability piece was an additional add. And so really looking for those those partnerships or those overlaps have been a big reason or big um, opportunity to build that case for it now. Um, there's, as I was gonna say, there's not infinite time and infinite money. There never was infinite time and infinite money. Um, but the timelines and the funding have gotten a little bit tighter post pandemic. And so we really have to leverage what are those things like the, you know, you hear about from sustainability lenses is people, planet, profit, right? What's the social piece? What's the profit piece? Um, pulling all of those things together a bit more robustly and painting that picture a little more than we have previously. 
I'm going to chime Victoria. in on something put into the chat. Um, since we've talked a lot about certifications, both from Victoria and Kina, there is actually a certification that you can get on the bicycle side called Bicycle Friendly Business that ad, um, done by the League of American Bicyclists or LAB. I've just put the link. It's bikeleague.org slash business. And so if your businesses are interested in be, uh, being certified as bike friendly, uh, go there and see if you can apply and see if you can pass their criteria. Tim, this thank you for sharing that. Um, Cause I think it's another tool too. Like I would love to see how we rank cause I like to think that we're super bike friendly but maybe there's room for us to improve. So I will definitely leverage that. Thank you, Tim. So at this point, we wanna open it up to Q and A from the audience. I see some folks have been putting their questions in the chat but you're also welcome to come off mute and ask your question or raise your hand if you'd like and we'll call on you. Um, we'd love to hear what your questions are. So while folks are thinking, I do have one other question for Tim that I wanted to ask. Um, beyond basic things like offering bike parking or bike lockers, what are some other steps that our employers can take to encourage um, biking to work. I know you had mentioned just allowing people to take their bikes into the office, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on what that might look like for an employer to implement that or any other ideas that you've had. Well, taking them to the office is usually pretty easy because bikes are relatively small. Um, so I know in some high-tech offices, they have a certain look and feel they want. And so if you're in a, you know, average office, um, like when I worked, for the, uh, I worked for the Department of Public Health of Santa Clara County for a while, it was no issue because we just had, you know, cubicles are kind of average and not really fancy looking. I just rolled my bike in. But when I was at Apple, um, you know, they're very particular about their look and their appearance. And that's a little harder, but they do, they do have bike cages there in Adobe, um, which are nice. Now, some other things, uh, showers can be helpful. Like on my commute, it's 12 miles each way. Now, as an alternative to showers, it's a culture thing. But if you're, um, rather than ha having to have a shower at work so much, when I go a long way, um, I just do a little armpit wash in the bathroom <laughs> and that usually covers me and I switch my clothing. So when I'm riding that far, I take off my sweaty clothing, let it dry on my bike, wherever I park it. And then I just change into um, normal attire for a business. So no one knows I biked and um, was wearing a uh, cotton non-synthetics um, really helps reduce any odor issues. And um, as a zero waste direction, I, I don't use deodorant at all anymore. And I find if I just do a simple armpit wash at work, if I biked a lot, um, and then change the natural fabrics, it helps a lot. If I wear synthetics, like my biking gear is typically synthetics because it just sweats easier, but it magnifies odors. The synthetic fabrics, they just really magnify odors. So if you just wear cotton, it's uh, more friendly for the environment and it reduces smell. Um, so it, this culture shift that people were talking about is a big one. So if the leaders can role model this and be biking to work, and so they may show up at a meeting in biking clothing until they have time to change off. Um, that helps having other incentive programs. Uh, employers are giving free parking. That's an immense amount of money they're giving car drivers to incent them to drive to work. If they shifted a fraction of that, you know, that money they're spending providing car uh, parking spaces to encourage biking, give them a subsidy of a thousand or two a year to bike instead of drive. And that will switch a lot of people. They'll see money right in their pocket. Mm -hmm. um, promote, have energized stations for bike to wherever days or just promote um, uh, pledging to ride. That, those are all programs that we are at the bike coalition are providing for employers ready-made for them to take advantage of. They just need to promote them with their employees. Um, so all of those can help um, encourage uh, employees at businesses to bike more and be more environmental and get be healthier. It's great with the wellness program. Actually, it's sort of, you don't have to pay separately for the gym at your workplace, just encouraging people to bike. They've got the pre-made gym and then they can get a bike. Um, Facebook and Google actually, um, I believe they both subsidize um, bicycles, well, e-bikes for their employees that choose to switch over. There's a great incentive to get people out of cars and onto bikes. Thank Brianne, you, Tim. Lots of great ideas. Yes. One of the things that we did, um, and it actually started out of one of the personal trainers at our gym, which is like really interested in making what they were doing in the gym applicable. And so like, I, I think he just had this urge to fix and repair things. He's like, and like, this is how you use your muscles to fix and repair things. So he partnered with our bike club um, and like once a month would host a bike repair day. And it was great because then people who needed bike repairs could bring them in. 
um, or people who had something small that they wanted to tweak um, could learn how to do it there themselves. But it, it kind of became, a, it, it was more social than I think truly fitness, but it was a nice, again, kind of highlighting, we do it in the plaza out in the open space so people could see and it would drive attention and, and push that cultural awareness of bike to work, have a bike, use your bike. Um, and and it was, a, yeah, a fun social event. I think they had more fun socializing than like actually fixing bike things. Victoria, that's a great, great example of an innovative program that a workplace can do. And yeah, fixing bikes is very social. Um, at the bike repair clinics we've been running in Sunnyvale, they've been hugely popular. And people wander by, even the people who have bikes just come by to talk to us while they're fixing bikes. And fixing bikes for me is kind of like knitting is for a lot of people, sort of meditative, yeah. calming. It's just, you know, it's, it's not that hard to do and you figure things out. It's a little problem to solve. It's like a puzzle. And it's very rewarding after being at a computer all day long, a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, and it, it pushes that. people outdoors. So many benefits of biking. I don't see any more questions in the chat, so we're going to shift into the breakout groups, actually. Patty's going to share her screen with the slide and explain how you can choose your breakout group. Great. Thank you so much. I can knit, but I don't know how to fix a bike, so I'm just... <laughs> I'm just going to say that much. Um, so we're planning on having three breakout sessions um, really related to the speaker's expertise and the topics that they talked about. Um, the key for this discussion is really to share what has your organization done really well in terms of wellness over the past year and where can your organization make improvements um, based on some of the content that was shared in the discussion today. When I um, looked at the registration uh, that had come in, I had included a question about what your organizations are doing. And it was really interesting to get such a range from nothing, which is really unfortunate, um, to you know, employee wellness programs or days off, um, remote days, you know, just a kind of a mixture of things. So I think this, um, hopefully the breakout session will allow you to talk with an expert too. Um, that's why we brought this panel together because they really have a lot of great experience and expertise to share. So um, choose your breakout based on um, the presenters today and topics that are most interesting to you. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing and- uh, Just a comment, um, we seem to have a dropped number of people. so. So I that's think, the, yeah. <laughs> we'll have one 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 attendee per person that they break up in the breakout room. That is sometimes the other unfortunate thing during the transition. So we could always just open it up and just have an open discussion too, if we want to do that. That works as well. Yeah, because I I see only like four other attendees right now on our list. Yeah, that's fair. Just, four of I, us. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> I tell you, just like I said, the transition points create that opportunity for people to say, okay, now it's lunchtime, or now it's like I got to get to a meeting or get back to my email or whatever that is. So, okay, that works fine too. <laughs> we'll go ahead and open it up. Um, yeah, we, I think we'll just uh, not do that then. We won't, we won't go into the breakouts. Kat, thanks for putting yourself on camera. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Um, do you have anything you want to share or anything you want to ask the panelists? Uh, yeah, I um, I produced a TEDx fail talk of, of a bicycler. Her name is uh, Mercedes Ross. And I wanted to commend that TEDx talk to you because I thought it might be useful for you and all the things that you're doing for electrified transportation. My question is, how do we get mass adoption? I, I've just finished being in the TED conference and several of the talks were about uh, related to climate. I'm curious how you see the, the most radical, urgent uh, scaling of climate solutions related to each of your areas of expertise. I'll, I'll jump in, Tim. Um, in our area in California, um, getting mass adoption is hard because of the car culture we have and the, you know and also the car privilege um, we're generally quite wealthy in this area and can mostly afford cars um, so that the million dollars you saved a year is or, or for a lifetime isn't that large attraction but um, what other wealthy companies uh, countries have switched over if you look at Denmark Finland the Netherlands Sweden they have very strong biking cultures where everyone just bikes even the prime minister they, they're you know the top government leaders bike. Um, it's a combination of, of culture, 
and of desire, um, you know, they're recognizing it healthy. And then uh, bike, bike facilities. Um, we, if we build it, they will come. Um, and if we constrain car facilities, and actually, basically, if we stop investing in car infrastructure and switched all that money over to bike and walk, we well, first of all, we wouldn't need as much money. So we'd save a lot of money, <laughs> but then we wouldn't be constantly expanding and making a car movement much uh, more and more convenient. Um, we need to make biking and walking much more convenient, make car drivers go the long way around as they've done in the Netherlands um, and make biking walking the shortest, fastest option. In our surveys of people, speed matters. People want to get places as quickly as possible. So if we do make um, biking and walk, uh, walking really fast and make car driving really slow, people will naturally switch. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Tim, you know, what you were sharing really resonated with me. Um, one of the things that we've done with our campus, right, we're kind of spread out across 200 acres. So we're a large commercial park is is trying to do the exactly that, right, is make it easier to navigate around campus on foot um, or using micro mobility means, right, so a scooter or a bike and, and having those available for people to use if they need to get across campus more so than saying you know get in your car and drive somewhere like that should be more complicated for you uh one of the things that that doesn't necessarily do though is solve the commute issue and especially being in the bay area you have people commuting from all kinds of places to come here um, and so from a community aspect i think there definitely has to be more thought and effort put into urban design to make community that make spaces more bikeable and walkable right um I walk to the grocery store because it's a quarter mile from my house. So it makes sense. Um, when I had a little one, we'd take her stroller and it was great because it was stored and we didn't have to carry bags. Um, and now we still take it even though she won't use it because we need the storage space. But if, you know, arguably if we lived two miles down the street, I don't know if we would carry those things, right? We would have to rethink, okay, we need, I need a bike like Tim's. <laughs> Um, it would allow me to make buying food for six people easier to get to my house from the grocery store. And so really rethinking even how we do urban design, urban planning, and, and build communities around what are the things that we need to access um, and how do we make that from an infrastructure, infrastructure perspective not reliant on a car or on a vehicle. I'd like to emphasize that, that urban design um, aspect that Victoria just highlighted is so important. We need to make our communities more livable for humans versus machines and build things yeah. differently and um, get used to having density so we can walk and bike everywhere. Our transit systems aren't effective in this area and, and bicycling is less effective also because things are so spread out. They're designed around the car and that you can expect people to go long distances quickly in a car on these big highways. Um, if by creating a more concentrated nodes for and having them close together with, with retail and with stores and with offices and residential closer together in more of a city-like environment that we see more in Europe or on the East Coast, it makes it easier and more environmentally friendly for us to live. The other consideration is housing affordability. So oftentimes people can't afford to live in the same city that they work in. And so the commute's longer and it may be challenging to bike. So I don't have a good solution to the housing crisis, but I think that's another piece of the puzzle that we need to be considering when we're looking at um, urban planning. Brianne, excellent point, actually. And I do have a solution for that. So our car culture has caused us to have very expensive single family homes everywhere in our area, which just raised cost of living a lot. But by having denser housing, you, um, you can put more housing in one location and make it less expensive per unit of person needing to live there. Uh, but our, our model again, our, our car has actually forced this on us and our view of having suburban, you know, big spaces around everyone has just made living in the uh, Silicon Valley area just extremely expensive. Um, so our people, our younger generation now are living in San Francisco, even though it's expensive sort of to live there, but they're able to live in a smaller space. They don't need a car. So they don't need the garage. They don't need the storage for the car. They don't need to spend money on the the car so they can actually afford to buy a smaller unit um, in a denser location. And a lot of the younger people um, are really coming out of college, enjoy that environment because more college-like, they're close to each other. 
So we, we need to shift our thinking and how we do our, um, our, our development for housing instead of having a, um, little uh, McMansions everywhere as the ideal. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot that we can learn from places like Denmark, and there's a lot of good examples of how people can live in more harmony with the environment uh, and their communities. I will say I think this country is a little bit more founded on that urban sprawl, automobile, bigger is better idea. So it'll be interesting to shift that mindset and behavior, um, but I do think that our planet needs us to start looking at those things. Great question, Kat. Oh, thanks. I, I know in European cities, they have the bottom floor is retail and then residential is up above in these large um, company campuses of 200 acres. Could you ever imagine that there would actually be employee housing in those campuses? You know, that's one of the things that that we've thought about and talked about and even how we can potentially share our spaces with the community and still be mindful of you know security protection um right i i don't think we're in the position to say we necessarily want to build our own personal housing for employees but really partnering with south san francisco and the community to see how we can increase more affordable housing in the area and then maybe there's incentive programs that we give for employees. But looking back into the community and say, how, how can we help support the community to grow in this area? Um, in specific, in our area is looking at how do we partner with, with Oyster Point or this part of East of 101 in South San Francisco where we sit to look at how we're designing as a whole. Um, and transportation has been a big conversation around that. So how can we share transit options to come into this space because we do have our whole fleet of buses that are all electrified now so how do we share the charging infrastructure how do we share the bus infrastructure um how do we make routes from the ferry at oyster point to come into all of the different commercial sites that are here now or create this micro mobility where we have shared bikes or scooters so people can take the ferry here if they're coming from the East Bay or North Bay and then come come up to the parts of campus, all the parts of campus that aren't just genetic spaces. Um, the other one is I think around uh, food and that's honestly probably the easier is, is making cafe spaces that other businesses could access. But some of, again, some of that's going into the design is how, how do we set this space so that way also competitors, for honesty, you know, there's there's competing biotechs that are in this area now. Um, we're friends with them, but I, I don't think we would want them going up to the second or third floor of our building and leaving the cafe space if they were to come enjoy our food. But it, I mean, instead of all of us having a cafe, if we could share space, it, it makes more sense um, for multiple reasons. Yeah, and Kat, you brought up a really good uh, point, having retail at the ground level really helps. And rather than having maybe have as many cafeterias, then um, businesses can stimulate the local economy by eating out at the restaurants that are in the area. Um, some good examples, actually Adobe located its headquarters in downtown San Jose before San Jose had come around with the forward thinking purpose that it would be integrated into that city. And now the city is growing up and maturing around it. Um, and they have their campus right there. Google now is locating a big thing at the transit hub, also near Adobe, near uh, Deerden Station. Um, and do Google actually going even further as far as housing goes, they're actually putting in housing in Mountain View and Sunnyvale as part of their, they're building new communities around their densest um, employment spots so that um, busing is great. It's certainly a big win over bike, uh, over, sorry, I'm driving. Um, biking's still better than buses though. <laughs> but by having the people right there close to them, that's even better because you don't have to move them very far and it's very convenient. Yeah. You have a nice uh, quality of life because you don't have to go very long. And then if your babysitter or your child care is having an issue, then you can pop out quickly to take care of that without having to drive a long way. I'm going to think of another um, company on the East Coast, SAS Institute, which does statistical software. Um, they also went for an integrated community approach where they had healthcare and everything right on their campus near where they're housing. Um, so it was a very integrated community environment. I'm seeing Google now um, going in that direction as well. Since, you know, Tim, since we were talking about certifications earlier, that is one of the things I like about the FitWell scorecard in particular is 
the location. So they, they do walkability scores and locations, and it's essentially looking at what kind of services are within walkable distance. Um, public accessibility to, to first floor amenities, we'll say. So any type of things, it could be retail space on a first floor. You they they incentivize that you you want to build in that way because it's more supportive of the community as a whole and not just necessarily your single occupancies occupants that are in that one building. Hey Tim, a question came in um, to me privately. Ideas for converting your bike to an e-bike with company incentives and or discounts. And I found this interesting because I saw this as twofold. It's like, can you convert your bike to an e-bike? That's a cool idea. But then the other piece of it was the company incentives and discounts. So if you could address that, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I'm aware of company incentives that encourage purchasing a whole e-bike. Um, it is possible to convert, although um, some of the kits aren't as, like when you come up with a great product, it's well designed so everything fits well together. And the e-bikes, they're just, they're designed all around that extra electricity. And so I know um, there have been some very successful conversion kits, um, particularly um, rear hubs that have been replaced with an electric motor. Um, you don't have the option of doing a mid-drive motor with a rebuild of an existing bike, but you do have an option of replacing the rear wheel with a motor built into it. Um, that is an option that can be uh, less expensive, but then it's, yeah, you're redesigning something into a product that the retrofit, it can be a little more challenging and it's not as smooth. Uh, the new e-bikes, wow, they are so nicely integrated with all of the forms and features just fitting nicely together. That it's just very natural um, how everything's positioned and how it all works. So they've got built-in lights, the cables are all routed inside the tubes, you know, the cleaner look, cleaner feel, easier to maintain and appropriate robustness for the, um, like the drive chain, if you add a, a electric motor to an existing bicycle with this drive chain, it might not have been that well designed to support the extra load that would be on it versus an e-bike. It's built around, oh, you've got the legs and you've got the motor and trying to make sure everything's well balanced in the full design. So yes, it's very doable. I don't know about incentives for that. I do know of incentives for full e-bikes. And um, I'm a big fan right now still of actually just a pure pedal power bike. That's mostly what I do, but I have tried some e-bikes and like, wow, at some point, I will I'll be getting there uh, with an e-bike, but um, I'm still fit enough that I just get around fine without the extra assist. Yeah, they're definitely very sleek looking. I'm seeing a lot more around. Um, people are really adopting them. And I almost feel like I was one of the naysayers. It was like, no, I would pedal on a bike. And now I'm like, I live on a top of a hill. Like, well, I could actually use this instead of getting in my car and actually get my groceries. Like maybe there is a use case. Oh, so there are a lot of use cases because it makes it feel super human. You're like, wow, I can go so fast. <laughs> and so my wife who doesn't bike as much as I do, when we go on some bike tours, she's got an e-bike so she can zip along with me and she doesn't feel like she's being left behind. Um, another comment, the follow-up question was, um, there's a brand called Switch. It's a London-based company that's making conversion kits, I guess. I don't know if you've heard of them or familiar with I them. I haven't heard of them. Yeah. Like, okay, great. Thanks. Well, I think we can wind up. I didn't think we'd go the full time, especially because the breakouts didn't happen. But thank you so much, everyone, for presenting, staying with us, the few that did. Um, really appreciate everything and uh, being here with us today. So thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.